Hello, and welcome to Stewart's Chapel Baptist Church, a place where you and your family can feel right at home. Located in Flintville, Tennessee, you are always welcome here, led by Pastor Don Pearson. You will find a warm and welcoming environment here at Stewart's Chapel. Join us as we worship together.
Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come into your house this morning to sing these praises, to open your word, to, to, hear, to hear the message that Brother Don has prepared for us. God, I pray that if there's no one here that knows you, that knows you completely, God, that they would come to you, that you would call them, God, that they would surrender their life to you today. I say all this in Jesus' name. Amen. movie that was driving somebody, what was it? Miss Daisy. Bob, don't you dare call me Miss Daisy. Let me see who I'm preaching to. I haven't had a chance to really look around. Looking good. Happy Mother's Day. Graduates, congratulations. Logan, can you see me? If when we come to the end, and she's okay, how I'll know it, you'll need to walk over here with her, okay? Stand by the baptism. And when she, If I see you over there, I know that she's good, okay? All right. Go ahead and do the video. Dan Letha for Reasons for Hope. And today we're going to be talking about First Peter First five, Peter five six, through seven. six through seven. So, so First Peter five, First Peter five six, through seven, six through seven says, "Humble yourselves, humble yourselves therefore, under, therefore, the, mighty under the mighty hand of God, hand of God so, th so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you." So this week we're going to be talking about anxieties and worries again like we did last week. Now last week's verse was a don't, don't worry. So God tells us not to do some, some things sometimes. And then sometimes he tells us to do something sometimes. And so this week's verse features a do. We're supposed to cast our anxieties to him because he cares for us. Have you ever had one of those weeks where things aren't going right and you've got all these things on your mind and you're your mind just seems like a collection basket for worries and anxieties and, and cares. And uh, this lady, I think this is what's going on with her. She doesn't have, she doesn't look like she's having a very good week. She's got a, one of those looks on her face like, oh, she's just straining under the weight of all the anxieties that she's carrying. And, um, and again, the Lord knows us and he, he wants the best for us. And so his instruction to us is don't worry and to cast our anxieties to him and, and cares on him. And in fact, he knows that uh, we're not created to carry these things. These things can be more weight than we can carry. And, and real, really, um, what can we do about a lot of them sometimes? There's, not any, there's, there's nothing we can do about them. Um, just holding on and carrying them ourselves shows that we're not really trusting God. We don't want to give these things over to him. We, we want to worry and have anxiety over them because it feels like we can do something about them. But in reality, we really can't. And so, again, our good God says, don't carry these things. Don't, you know, try to do something about them because you can't. He wants us to trust in him 
and to cast these anxieties onto him. And so the first lady, again, she's burdened and she's under this weight that God doesn't want us to have. The second lady, which is actually the same lady, um, she looks like she's having a better day. And so she's, um, it doesn't look like she has this weight on her. We'll have to see what she's doing. In fact, I think you can probably guess, you know, with what the verse says. It says, cast your anxieties on God because he cares for us. And I, th I find it interesting, too, that if, if you think about it in, in terms of this image here, the first lady has this weight on her that she can't carry. She's really struggling. But yet God says, take that weight that you can't carry, that's too heavy for you, that's a burden for you, and I want you to pick it up, and I want you to throw it my way. I want you to take this thing that you can't carry and throw it. And it seems like those two things don't go together. But God gives us the power to do that. He gives us the ability to take these weighty things that are too heavy for us, to pick them up, and to actually throw them. And, and in doing so, say, Lord, I trust you with these things. You are the God that can do something about it. I can't. I trust you with this. And so this week as you have worries and cares and anxieties coming your way, I want you to stop and think, wait a minute, these are things I'm not supposed to bear. Um, I want to I wanna give these things over to the one that can do something about them. Lord, I trust you, and I'm going to throw it your way. So, you know, that's not normal for me, to especially show a video that's five minutes and 52 seconds. I know. Me and Don try to cut it down some. And, um, but after a while, I finally told Don, I said, man, <laughs> I'm taking up way too much. I'm sitting at home on the couch, and it's like, Don, we're going back and forth all day. I said, Don, you, you go back to work, and we'll just show them the whole, whole thing. Actually, we did cut. I just had them cut off a, another segment, but I don't do that. When you're laying on the couch for two weeks, you know what you do? You watch every YouTube video you can find. I've done, at one time there was 22 sermons, now it's up to 26 sermons I've done in two weeks. That's unusual. I'm not talking about notes. I'm talking about whole written out stuff. I was bored to death. I had never heard of draw it and know it. But when I encountered it, I go, and he does this for all kinds of other verses, and I was actually looking for some, some information. All my books were at the, at the office, and I was looking for a, a, someone else's insight on the First Peter 5, 7. And that's how I found Draw It, Know It. I will tell you that work with children, vacation, Bible school, there are tons of them out there. And they're all short, very, very good. There was one statement in the whole video that caught my attention. And this is it. That which you cannot carry, that which you cannot pick up, God empowers you enough to hurl it. You can't even pick it up. You can't even carry it. But he empowers you to hurl it, cast it in his direction. Um, most... Uh, Everybody that's been here any time at all know that I'm an extremely active person. And um, this has been very humiliating, but humiliating and humbling are not the same. Um, but it's also been very humbling. I have, I'm not going to read it, I had a whole legal page of all the stuff that were going on in you over the last two weeks. And I bet you didn't know but maybe about, about one of them. And that was probably yours. I will share a couple. Last Sunday when I went out the door, I was asked to pray with somebody because they were going to go that Monday, the same day I was having my surgery, see a doctor about something. They went. They measured it. Yesterday, they found out that in two weeks, 
had nearly doubled. And that's one of you. At the same time, the last Sunday I was here on the way out, a family asked me, and it was very unusual, it was the man that asked me, he was filled with emotion, uh, not this kind of man, he said, you need to pray for my family. And I saw it in his eyes. I knew I needed to pray for his family. I had surgery on the next day, and I texted him on Tuesday. I said, how's your family? And he shared a little bit more information with me. It was actually an extended family, not his immediate. Well, I texted him again Wednesday. I said, actually, I called him on Wednesday. I said, how's it going? He said, I'm on my way there now. Thursday, I think it was Thursday, you deacons will know because it all, everything ran together. So it had been a week ago this past Thursday. I've only had, I mean, I'm just two days out of surgery. My foot is just killing me. Calls me about 8.30. A family member who I've never met, hadn't met at that time, says, would like to, would like to talk to you. We've been telling him about you that you were praying for us. And so I talked to him on the phone. And the man was extremely emotional. Handed the phone back. The guy handed the phone back to the to one of you, one of us. And um, at that moment, the um, man that one of you was extremely emotional. And I said, um, you guys can... Be patient. It's going to take me a while because this was good. Winchester and I'm in Mac Bird. It's going to take me a while. I have not been off this couch. He said, but if you'll be patient, I'll get Trish to let me stretch out in the back of the couch and I uh, truck and we'll be there. It had rain. I am death on crutches. The yard, there was no way to get close to the house made it in. When I get in, the man's in bed. I lay on the bed, ask for his permission to lay down next to him so I could stretch out my foot and held his hand as he wept and ministered to him. I got home about 1 o'clock that night, Thursday, Friday morning. Sunday morning when you were thinking all hell was breaking loose in your life, that guy blew his head off. That family is still dealing with all of that, and so am I. I'll do his funeral the night of your rehearsal. Don't worry, I've already talked to them. We've worked that out. And the family is gracious to allow me to do the rehearsal and then go do the funeral. There's a lot more. You know what cares do to you? Cares cause you to become extremely focused on you. You forget what's going around on you. There are people that bring in cares into this place constantly, some heavier than you and I or I would ever want to carry. Some of our spouses sit alone week after week and pray. There are secrets in us, among us, that people keep very guarded and protected, but they still carry those burdens. Let me read the scripture. It's 1 Peter 5, 5 through 8. Likewise, you younger people, isn't that interesting? There's a whole context here. He's just talked to all the elders, the mature, and especially those in leadership. Now he turns his attention to everybody else. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you. That's interesting. All of you? There's two different ways to interpret that, all of you. In fact, I called enough pastors to bug them like I did Don to say, hey, 
is all of you talking about, hey, all of you young people? Because in the context, that's what it implies. I said, but most of the time, it doesn't. Most of the time, we preach it as all of us. The bottom line is, it can be interpreted both ways. But in the context, it is a special warning to the young. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another. The reason he's talking about that, he has just been talking. Peter and Paul will go through this long list of who you're supposed to be submissive to. He comes back to it here at the end. So be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God does resist the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting, hurling, launching, violently shoving all your cares upon him. That is God. He cares for you. That Greek there, I had too much time to study, all right? That Greek phrase, he cares for you, isn't well, that's an English phrase, but the Greek means it matters to him, you. That's literally the way it ought to be translated. It matters to him, you. We would say, I matter to him. But what it says is, no. You're constantly on his heart. He cares so deeply for you. Especially in the midst of your cares. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking, seeking whom he may devour. Father, Lord, the, I recognize you speaking to me so much during the last two weeks is a blessing to me. But when it comes to this time, there's so much going around on in me. I just want to uh, just release it all. You keep me extremely focused and on your spirit and your word. And may your word be louder than I am in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first statement in 1 Peter is critical. And that's true for all of God's word. Every book you come to, the first few verses is critical to knowing what it's all about. So listen to the word that God tells Peter to use in verse 1. You pilgrims. You that are only passing through this world. You that are strangers and aliens. You who know that this world and everything of it, including your cares, are fleeting and passing because this is not your home. You have another destination. And so when God tells Peter to talk to these people, he says, first of all, let me tell you something. This is not your home. Do not get so attached to it that the things of this world consume you. You remember that you are just passing through. And then in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he says to the same ones who are passing through, he says to them, hey, do not be surprised by the fiery trials that are going to come your way. Don't be caught off this surprised by it. You're pilgrims. You're passing through a world that is not your own, a world that is against you, that is working against you. So when you encounter this world, do not be surprised if things don't go, man, like we want it to go. I'm going to ask you two questions, or one question and a statement. I want you to listen to the question very carefully. Have you ever 
gotten confused in knowing what is his to fix and what you are to fix. Have you ever become confused in knowing what you're supposed to fix and what only God can fix? Have you? Do not become confused and confuse your responsibility with God's sovereignty. Do not confuse your responsibility with God's sovereignty. If you confuse your responsibility with God's sovereignty, then you will be fighting cares that only he is supposed to be fighting. Be real clear about what you are supposed to fix and what you're supposed to let him fix. And I want to tell you, the list of the things that you and I are supposed to fix are much, much smaller than we think. This is all introduction. Let me get to it because I want to walk you through the scripture. So just be tolerant a little bit. I started writing a list of why we suffer. And many of them came from the phone calls and texts this week as people shared that just being confessional about why they realized that God, just, God was going to do it, but they needed to let him. One, we suffer because we're his. We're suffering his. Would you agree that God's timing is always perfect? God's timing is incredibly perfect. Does do any of you know when 1 Peter was written? 62 AD. This letter was written in 62 AD. It took two years for it to circulate among the believers. That brings you to what? 64 A.D. Do you know what happens in 64 A.D.? The city of Rome catches on fire. And the emperor blames Christians. And in 64 A.D., the ones that God was trying to prepare two years earlier... They're captive, they're raped, they're slaughtered. Thousands are crucified along the streets of Rome and set on fire. Another truth. The casting of your cares is not about the casting of your cares. It's about you. We suffer because we are his. We suffer because we are. A Yankee would just simply say stupid. But I'll be biblical. Because we're foolish. We suffer because we're proud. Unmovable. Stubborn. We suffer because we ignore his authorities. It is interesting that be, if you follow the pearls to this point, he has got, Peter has laid out the authorities. Government leaders, submit to them. Employers or masters, submit to them. Parents, submit to them. Husbands, submit to them. Religious and church leaders, submit to them. When you ignore the boundaries... And you only submit when it, when it is agreeable to you. When you create a situation, for example, when a parent is distrustful of teachers, and that child knows that, don't be surprised if that child is disrespectful to, to teachers, and don't be surprised if they're distrustful of you. The same thing for government the same for parents or spouses. Your kids watch it, and when you break God's boundaries, don't be surprised. 
if those that live with you break those boundaries too. We suffer because we ignore God's boundaries. We suffer because we sin. We suffer because we think we're the Holy Spirit. We're fixers. And when we try to fix everyone and everything, we suffer because we are controllers. We got to have our hands in it. By the way, that's me. I str- I'm, a, I'm a controller. I'm a fixer. Everything that we've talked about, I, I, that's me. We suffer because we have unrealistic expectations of other people and of ourselves. We suffer because we're still carrying the hurt from the last time we got hurt, which makes you much more sensitive to the cares and the pain. We suffer because we are collectors. We're still holding on to the last pair. We're su- we suffer because of the great I. Our language sounds like God. I. I told you. I saw this. I knew if everybody, I, 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 I. You see, you only do that because you are confused about knowing what is his to fix and what is yours to fix. We suffer, and I grew up with one like this, because we are perfectors. My mother, if Trish was here, she would smile, and my brother is here somewhere, probably watching the security cameras. My mother would wake us up in the middle of the night. I'm talking about 2 or 3 o'clock in the middle of the night, moving pictures. There would be a picture that she would wake up. It would just obsess her through the night because that picture wasn't in the right place and it just wasn't crooked or it was crooked or whatever. And she would get up in the middle of the night and be hammering on the outside of your wall in your bedroom, putting up a picture. And when she, and you walk through the house, if anything was just out of, I mean, constantly. I'm like that. I can't help it. I go into a house. I look at your trim. I bet Tommy looks at your cabinets. Some of us suffer because we think we are proven. Let me unpack that for a second. Because we've been able to fix other people's problems, we think we can fix every problem. Remember, Do not confuse what is his to fix and what is yours to fix. Introduction. Almost done with the introduction. There are five things in the verses that I read that God says will happen. One you will find release from your burdens. They're all connected to the casting. You will find release from your burden. But that's not the primary thing. But that's one of the things. That's just an extra. One of the other things is you're going to be able to resist Satan. You're not going to have that lowering you down. You're not going to be found in a weak state. You're going to be standing strong. But that's not the primary focus. You're going to become settled. That's the New King James word. You're going to become settled. Settled in God. You're going to become settled. You're going to find peace and rest. But that's not the primary thing you're after. You're not primarily after about the release of your burdens. You're not primarily after about the being able to resist Satan. You're not primarily after being able to just, you know, just rest. Have some peace. The fourth thing is you will be exalted in due time. Hey, it's going to be a different day. But that's not the ultimate desire. The last one's found actually in verse 11. You will give glory to God. In the midst of the time, you're just pestering God all the time. You're making things worse. And now, but at the end, when you get all done with it, what? Oh, God, praise the Lord, God. There won't be any room for you to be praised. Won't be any room for any of you, everybody else to be praised. 
No room for the doctors, no room for anybody else. And when it's all said and done, the ultimate purpose that you and I are called, and that is to give God glory, finally happens. And that's the ultimate thing. But you can't get there until you figure out how to cast your cares. And this is just a side note, and I'll do this real quick. I, as I study scripture on the cares, I found out that the Bible actually lists four ways that man deals with trying to get rid of their cares. Only one of them is God's way. If there's two books of the Bible, Luke 24 and Matthew 13, they both talk about it, and then there's this Peter passage. In Luke 21, 34, it's called drunkenness or sedation. Alcohol, drugs, pain pillars, whatever, you come to a place where you sedate yourself. The care's still there. You're just numb. It's Luke 21, verse 34. In Matthew 13, 22, it says one of the ways that man takes care of his cares is through the word more. More riches, more this, more that. Just, I'm just going to go on a buying tree. I'm just going to go spin. I'm just going to get more, 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 more about me. The care is still there. The third way, also in Luke 21, verse 34. It says uh, King James is carousing. What, what you would understand is uh, incredible hunger for pleasure. There is no limit. You lose all restraints. You fill yourself with pleasure. But your cares are still there. The only true biblical way for you and I to Get rid of our cares is by casting them to God. All right, let's walk through this passage. I've got to move this foot somewhere a little bit lower. Here for a second. I want you to look, if you got your Bibles, eventually, I've already talked to Garrett and Velva. Uh, Eventually, I want us to do what a lot of churches I've been in, and I know it's going to cost us some money, so Jeff and Linda, you just become prepared for that. But eventually, I want us to be able to show two things on these two different screens, different things in this screen, one for Scripture and one for the other. All right? I don't want you, but right now, don't just go to the next slide, trust that leads to submission. All right? And I wanted to walk you through this. Trust that leads to submission. I think it should be the next slide, Lucas. Maybe frozen a little bit. Let's read this scripture. So he starts in verse 5. He says, likewise, you, you, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, submission to one another and be clothed with humility. Submission is the first key. I can't get my, this leg comfortable. Just a second. I'm going to have to let it hang. You're not going to get rid of your care until you submit. You see, until you answer that first question and realize that the, that the sovereign one is the only one that you need to be depending upon, you're going to keep your care. Now, here's the thing about submission. Those of you that have been here for a long, long time have heard this. Biblical submission is always without understanding. Hear that again. Biblical submission is always without understanding. If you only submit when it makes sense to you, then you biblically haven't submitted. If you only submit when they're doing what you want them to do, then you haven't submitted. And that doesn't matter whether it's from the top. Realize what Peter's talking about when he says submit to the government. The government is about to destroy them.
trust leads to submission. You can't get away from that. Someone doesn't trust you, they're not going to submit. That doesn't matter whether it's your wife, husband, child, citizen, church member. It don't matter. They don't trust you. They ain't going to submit. And you can force compliance. But compliance is not submission. Trust leads to submission. The greater the trust, the easier, the greater, and the faster the submission. We live in an age that rebels against every authority. We refuse to submit. We refuse to submit to God. You, 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 look, you are thinking that when, for example, and, and I've heard this so many times, when God says to the wives to submit to the husbands, you know what the wives are thinking? They're thinking about, well, he, he's not worthy to be submitted to. You don't understand. It's not your husbands that are telling you to submit. It's God. When God lists what you and I are supposed to submit to, it doesn't matter. Because the bottom line is, are you going to submit to God? Now, if you're not strong in your faith, or you just got a wishy-washy faith, just an average faith, I guarantee it, you can get by without submission. Because that's how you live. But if you're a strong follower, mature believer of Christ, submission is critical. Trust leads to submission, but submission leads to humility. Submission leads to humility. Submit yourselves and be clothed with humility. There is literally an, a whole connection there. Go to the next slide, Lucas. Um, submission leads to humility. But I want you to notice it says, therefore, humble yourself, verse 6, under the mighty hand of God. <laughs> The mighty hand of God. It's almost like you don't have a choice. What it's saying is the mighty hand of God has been on your life and you've been resisting it. And he's saying now stop fighting him. Stop resisting him. Stop getting in his way. Let the mighty hand of God push you closer to the earth where you should be. The mighty hand of God is described in Scripture as a delivering hand. It's described as a disciplining hand. It's described as a directing hand. It's described as a defining hand. And this is trying to define you into an image of humility. But it's also a definite hand. In other words, it's not going away. It's right there. You can fight against his hand, or you can yield to it. The evidence of humility is that you walk closer to him and closer to the earth. Hear this. Humiliation is not humility. Grief is not brokenness. Bruised is not brokenness. Brokenness without humility is of no value. There is no humility if you are still maintaining your rightness. If you're still trying to justify yourself, then there is no humility. Biblical evidence of trust, submission, and humility is that it leads us to the next thing. It leads you to letting True biblical evidence of trust, submission, at least to humility, is you, you let go. And you do it violently, aggressively. You take something that you can't even bear, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit fills you with a power, and you don't just kind of drop it. You don't just let it fall off behind you. You take it and you hurl it at God. But you do not get 
to casting. You and I don't get to detect, de, de, uh, dictate how Scripture is. You can't get to casting without trusting, and you can't get to casting without um, submission, and you can't get to casting without humility. It's a progress. But when you get to casting, you fling it. You throw it down. I don't know whether you know it. In most of the translations, verse 6 and 7 are two different verses. But in the Greek, verses 6 and 7 is one sentence. It's not two steps. They go together. When you humble yourselves, you cast. If you're not humbling yourself, then you don't cast. Casting is not cast and retrieved. You're not still tethered to it. You can't throw it out and then pull it back. It's not a cast and a retrieve. You're not fishing. It's not a catch, release, and catch again. By the way, it's hairs is plural, meaning not just one but all of them. It matters to him about you. Now, this is not from me. This comes from somebody else. This is not mine. So listen to this. This You're going to think, where is he going on this? 1.3 million earths to fill our sun. You hear that? It takes 1.3 million earths to fill our sun. There are five to nine billions of our suns to fill the biggest sun in our universe. Five to nine billions of our sun to fill the largest sun in our universe. There are 100 to 400 billion stars or suns in our galaxy. There are 200 billion to true trillions, and everybody's just guessing because they don't really know galaxies in the universe. There are 8 billion people estimated to be alive walking on this earth today with you and me. Throughout time on earth, it has been estimated that there's 108 to 200 billion people that have lived on earth. And guess what? In the midst of all that, God cares for me. Me. I'm not even a little pencil spot. Now, when you have a care, you make that little pencil spot what? God cares for you. Let's finish up. Well, we're not there yet. We're not to God's ultimate goal, and that ultimate goal is that we glory in him. So trust leads to submission. Submission leads to humility. Humility leads to casting. What does casting do? Well, according to verse 8, casting brings you to a place of sober-mindedness, a mind that is uncluttered, a mind that is focused And a focused mind leads to watchfulness and alertfulness. And guess what now? Now you're able to resist Satan. Now most of us never get to that end. Most of us don't get to that end. Because most of us don't even get to the first part. Through trusting. Now you can tell you can tell God all the time, and I can tell God all the time that I'm trusting. But until I really get to the place of trusting, I'm not going to be able to get to the other. But you see what we want? We just want our care, God. You can't resist the devil. 
you're not going to know what it is to be exalted in due time. You're not going to know what it means to be able to rest in God. You're not going to know what it is to be able to give him all the glory. God doesn't share his glory. He doesn't share it with me. I made that mistake many, many times in this place, as in this pulpit and other places in this church. There has been more than one time where I have robbed you, sometimes individually and sometimes collectively, because I tried to take was not rightfully mine to take. I'm going to tell you something. I'm not the only one. Remember that whole group? Church leaders do it. Parents do it. Husbands do it. Employers do it. Government do it. None of us are supposed to do that. I don't have to ask if any of you have cares and burdens. I already know that, and you do too. Don't just pass and retreat. You detach that tether, and you hurl it, so there's no way for you to retrieve it. Old preachers used to say, you lay it down and you leave it laying down. There are times when you and I have a responsibility. But even when we have a responsibility, we would better respect his boundaries. But I will be the first to admit, I live mostly confused about what God wants me to be involved in and what I'm supposed to just sit back and let him do. I get impatient. I don't, nobody likes to be living with their care. So I, I get impatient. What I end up doing, though, is prolonging living with this care. Andrew, come on. Thank you for joining us today at Stewart's Chapel Baptist Church in Flintville, Tennessee. We're grateful you watched the service today and hope you find it uplifted. Remember, you're always welcome here at Stewart's Chapel. Until we meet again, may God be with you.